There we go. So, Justin, at this exact time yesterday, I was down in this room, and you'll never guess who was sat right where you are now. Who? <laughs> Your old friend and old bandmate. Mr. Ricky Warwick. Hey, Ricky. Bless right you. there. And I want to go straight into this with you. He told me about, it was his second gig with New Model Army. And I guess his kind of second proper big show. And it was the biggest of big shows. It was the Berlin show that you did with the late, great Mr. David Bowie. I wonder if you could tell us, first of all, how that gig opportunity came around. And then your memories of, of that day. I once read in a women's magazine... That the the key to a happy life is good health and a bad memory. Right. <laughs> it's going to be a fun podcast then. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, next year is the fortieth anniversary, and you're like, we're going to have to deal with the past. And I'm going to spend January trying to remember stuff that I've tried to forget. <laughs> we did a big gig with David Bowie in front of the Reichstag in '86. Um, the wall's still up. And the wall was still up. Apparently, there was thousands of people listening on the other side of the wall. That's what Ricky um, said. You could hear the uh, chants. And the... It was all... The whole thing was very strange. Um, how we got the gig, I'm not sure. I think, basically, there was a guy uh, that was promoting it who was a fan. Right. And we, um, we were kind of unknown at the time. So it was a kind of, um, do you want to support David Bowie at the rice tank? We're going, uh, yeah. The There's remember, no way in that scenario then it's going to be no, is there? <laughs> the thing I remember most about it was we were very excited, and it was nothing, you know, nothing to lose, and and uh, uh, but we were very excited. And ten minutes before we went on, there was a knock on our porter cabin door, and in walked David Bowie to say uh, thank you for doing the the gig and uh, wishing us well, and uh, talking a little bit about the Berlin audience as if we knew very much about you know. Which I always thought was extraordinarily generous of him. He didn't need to do that. And and I always remembered that. And then we actually, over the years, we played quite a lot of gigs with him. Um, and as you would sort of expect, he was always kind of, you know... Uh, genteel. Uh, genteel, polite, you know. But extraordinarily knowledgeable Englishman. Uh, he just knew a lot about a lot. And was fascinating to talk to. I can't say I spent hours and hours talking to him, but I did sort of talk to him on and off over a few years. Um, and it was always really pleasant. But I always remembered that gesture, which he didn't need to do, and I just thought that was generous. I remember thinking it at the time. And obviously when you are exposed to the generosity of a man like that, obviously it's perhaps only later on down the line when you maybe encounter more people of a similar level and you don't receive the same amount of, of warmth and hospitality that you realise yeah. how special yeah. it was or in hindsight. Yeah, or if we've right? got a band supporting us, you know, we you always try to make a point of doing the same, yeah. Yeah. Even if, you know, even if I'm... I mean, we tend to... One of the, our, our routines on tour is that certainly me and Michael and Dean... And Kerry, actually, um, we all tend to go to bed before the gig. I heard so you often, saying this. We often I heard miss you saying the this, support yeah. band. We like to wake up an hour before we play, because that way, I mean, you're always tired on tour, so you can always sleep. Yeah, um, anywhere. But you, yeah, yeah, anywhere, anytime. But uh, but if you wake up an hour before a gig, every there is nothing else in your brain as you wake up. There is nothing. The day doesn't. The day's gone. You know, there, there's nothing else. There's no. There's just the gig. So you go through all the things, you know, to wake up, to get focused, to stretch your body out and to get ready. And that's the perfect kind of preparation for it, actually. So often I don't see the support plans, I'll be honest. It's almost like beyond meditation, like the plane above, because you're literally hitting reset. Yeah, in a way, actually, now you mention it, yeah, I get it. it is a bit like that. Have you got any other acts like that from the past that you've either supported or perhaps you've taken out and then they've gone on to to become quite spectacular that come to mind because um, you're quite a unique band and I imagine it's quite hard sometimes we, we to place you within a certain no, no, we don't arena fit, we don't kind of fit in we fit in everywhere and nowhere yeah um, the we've never been out with a band on tour really ever um, wow as a, as a support yeah, band yeah 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 ever um, we've obviously played with lots of people and, and festivals are always kind of nice because you get to say hello to people um, although they're not great for in-depth conversations, no. because if time you're, is tight, uh, isn't it? Well, if you're going to be playing, 
your brains on what you're going to be doing and after you've played. If you play early, then you've got time after. I remember this summer we played a, a big, kind of big corporate rock festival in Austria, which was kind of like the same bill as Download. Um, flying between the two sort of thing same weekend and um, and the idols were on yeah. same stage yeah, yeah. we were on so I got to have a bit of chat with them after and that was that was really nice it's kind of where you meet people in it uh, at festivals but we've never done a uh, had a band you know we've never done a a support tour but I was just thinking about this the other day we did have a band support us um, called the Virgin Marys about I know those guys very ago. well, yeah. And um, and then recently I had a solo gig and Ali uh, from Virgin Mary's wrote to me and said, can I come and support you? And he did, and he was really good. And since then we've been in touch. He's been sending me their latest stuff, which has uh, moved on quite a bit, and I think it's really good. And also some of his acoustic stuff, which is also really good. Um, so you do you do have these kind of relationships that, that, that develop sometimes. I remember because we had a couple of journeys together in the car a few years ago when we were sort of touring around cinemas doing these Q&As for the, the release of the documentary. And that was lovely for me to get to spend some proper time with you. And you were kind of playing DJ. It was me and Jonathan sat in the front seat of the car and you were kind of in the back sort really? of selecting random songs and artists. And it was a nice insight into the, the broadness and the breadth of, of your musical taste. Um, and you're obviously someone who's still engaged with, with new music and upcoming bands. You mentioned obviously a couple there. Is that something that's important to you to keep those ears and mind open and absorb as much? Oh God, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't. Can. I don't. My very favourite records, I try not to listen to too much because if you've got a favourite song, it has a kind of it's it's a magic. It's magic. You have this special relationship with a song. And you know that it has the power to lift your mood more than any drug or, or you know what I mean? It has a special power. And the way to, you kind of know that to, in order for it to keep its power, the trick is not to use it too often. Yes. Because um, you can have too much of a good right. thing. That's yeah, right. Yeah, you can, you can wear down its power by over listening. So I have my favorite. So I don't, you know, I've got my favorite records, but I don't tend to listen to them too much. What I listen to more than anything else is FIP which is a French radio station, um, which you can get on the internet. And now there's the main FIP and there's FIP Groove and FIP Rock and FIP Metal and FIP Reggae and FIP a little bit more genre But I, I tend to listen to the main FIP, which you can also get on, you know, on a normal radio when you're in Paris, um, which is anything released from 1920 to yesterday by anyone. Wow. In any order. And, and you've got no idea what they're going to play next. And 90% of what they play, I've never heard. And what they're playing is usually really interesting. Don't love it all, but I do love quite a lot of it. And I keep discovering new stuff on this radio station. And it might and not necessarily be new in the, the chronological right. scheme, that's but new right. to you. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's... So I tend to have... If I'm, I don't listen to music all the time. I don't like background music much, but sometimes I have FIP on, and then every now and again you just run up and go, what's this? And then you can look it up online and find out what it is, because they don't tell you. Yeah, even um, better. They just play 24 <laughs> hours a day music. There's almost no talking. Um, it's just 24 hours a day music of all different genres. The other day I was listening, we were driving around Paris, and they played three jazz records in a row, and I was going, they do play quite a lot of jazz. And I was going, oh, God. I'm not sure about this. And then they played something from Quadrophenia. Then they played J.D. McPherson. Then they played a reggae, a really good reggae track. And then they played Mozart. That's my sort of radio. And that's a rare kind of station that's in today's that, world, yeah. isn't it? Even with internet radio. Yeah. Uh, did you ever used to listen to the Bob Dylan theme time radio hour show on, on Radio 2? No. It was so good. So each show, he'd take a different topic or theme or subject mm. and, you know, do a two-hour playlist of songs that are all about that subject whatever it is whether it's pigeons teeth doesn't matter more random the better and he'd give you background information and contextualize in the way that obviously only he could and it was one of the best shows i've ever heard i think they're still out there online you can get them I think Bob that, that what people, time radio people want to hear stuff they don't know this is why i get slightly sort of miffed with radio six is they, they tend yeah. to play stuff everybody knows it's like come on so much good music out there um, I yeah. saw Dylan recently live, right? And he was actually good 
for a, for a rare rare chance. I saw him good once as well. Yeah, yeah. it's the best, isn't it? It's is the most <laughs> rewarding thing. The first time I saw him, he just put out. I don't know whether you ever heard this. He did a Frank Sinatra covers album. And the gig entirely comprised of Frank Sinatra covers. That was it. And then he finished with some indecipherable version of Blowing in the Wind. But other than that, it was all these Frank Sinatra covers. That was the first time I saw him. I'd been waiting my whole life. Was mortified. But then he just did Hyde Park with Neil Young a couple of weeks ago. And I knew going into it, I was like, if ever there's going to be a day that he's going to be good, it's when he follows Neil Young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's the tough. Because Neil's to follow always, right good. There. always good, and always, always, always like, good, and you don't quite know what. I saw Neil Young about three years ago at uh, a uh, Roman amphitheatre in in Nîmes in the south of France, where we played once years and years ago, and I thought that's the place to see him. So I went, and it was with Crazy Horse. Yeah, which is and always he, the he best. Did, uh, and in the two and a half hour set, he did about two songs that anyone knew, but it was still brilliant. And there was one song about uh, only about half an hour into the gig, which finished with feedback, of course. <laughs> and the feedback went on and on and on. And they were moving up and down between the, uh, between the various sounds. So the feedback's changing tone, but it's just noise. But it's beautiful. Sound engineer's brilliant. It's this beautiful noise. 10 minutes, 11 minutes. And the crowd is starting to get restless. And... Uh, and at the time they had these fans on the side of the stage blowing rubbish across the stage as a kind of ambience for the for the noise. So it was also obviously planned. Fifteen minutes of this went on, and then finally it died down, and everybody's going, "What was that?" And then he came out with an acoustic guitar and played "Blowing in the Wind." Wow! It was like, huh? <laughs> you know, you got no idea what's See, coming. See, that's next. fucking with the audience, but in a way that is oh, entertaining still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah, yeah, Bob's really just kind of like back to the crowd, yeah, rearranges yeah, the yeah, songs. Yeah, You're like, yeah, what's yeah. he doing? Um, did you have any contemporaries when you were coming up? Did you have any artists that you looked to as you know part of a similar, either sonic kind of approach or perhaps an ideological attack, or did you feel like you guys were kind of out there on your own as this island? No, I think we were heavily influenced by what was happening at the time. Obviously, this was punk rock. Uh, both me and Stuart had been in the uh, Northern Soul thing, so you know we'd been at Wigan Casino and the whole soul music thing. Talcum powder on the dance floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> And, and that sort of fed into what we were uh, into the music. And it's always been funny to, with New Melomics. because I've always said, you know, Talon Motown is my first love. And they go, oh, that's a surprise. I'm going, you've never really listened to what yeah. we do. But Melody. It's all in there. <laughs> all the e emphasis on rhythm section. It's all about the bass and drums. You know, New Melomics is all about bass and drums. But the, the, there was one gig I went to in 1979 by the Ruts. I love those guys my so life. much. They're, this is the best gig I ever saw, bar none. 200 people in a little pub in Bradford. Um, and it was just around the time Babylon... I don't think Babylon's Burning had quite come out. I'd heard In a Rut on John Peel and loved it and went to see them. And in that gig was everything about being alive. Scary, beautiful, exciting, violent, um, uh, Everything. And I came out of the gig feeling like my soul had been cleansed. It was like one of those experiences. And it was a kind of template, that more than anything else. And then six months later, he died. But the, 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 the West One, which I think came out after he died, or around the same time, at the very end of West One, there's all you know, these, they shine on me, shine on me. And there's a line which I swear, and everybody was at that concert swears, is Bradford shine on me. And I wonder if that was a special night for them and all, because it was, uh, it was a, just an amazing night. That changed, that was kind of the template more than anything else. Okay, we brought in all these different influences and all the music we loved. Stuart was obviously very into Stranglers and I was into, I'd listened to a lot of, um, reggae and 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 great like say soul music i was quite in springsteen and, and and we brought all this stuff in but but the kind of energy of the time and the whole punk rock thing and especially that concert i recently one of the proudest achievements of my career is the ruts were doing a 40th anniversary tour to celebrate the crack and they did a gig in london at the shepherd's bush empire and they asked me to dj for an hour or so before they went on and just kind of get the crowd in the mood. And uh, yeah, like Ruffy and Segs have been good friends of mine for a few years now, been on the show and beautiful people. And Please, that night was you, so special. You, I have not seen them. 
Uh, I keep meaning to see them. Everybody tells me they're still great. And they are. They really are. Um, it's not one of those like. And to be honest, uh, to be honest, every band is because their rhythm section. So yeah, the, and they were great because not only was the spirit at the time and punk rock and everything, but they were fantastic musicians, and they had all that energy and, and brilliant. You know, genre. And uh, but I haven't actually seen them. If you say say hello to him from me and tell him that that gig in Bradford changed my life. I will. The I'll better. send them this audio. They'll love it. Um, a Killing Joker band that you yeah, appreciate and enjoy. Yeah, time for them as well. I, there were all these bands that came out... Uh, people talk about punk rock now as if it was a form of music. Yeah, which it ain't. It wasn't a form of music. It was a cultural revolution. It mm -hmm. was about the, the, the delivery of spirit being above all other things. And there were all these bands that, you know, all the rules were knocked out of the water. You can do anything you like. And all the bands that came out of that whether it's Depeche Mode, you know, with the electronics and, and all that, uh, or, or The Cure, or us, yeah, or Killing Adam Joe, we all, like some of the we all pop stars were, of the 80s went off in different it, directions. Yeah. Um, and Killing Joe, I've, you know, obviously we've played with them over the years. I've got lots of time for them musically. I think they're just uh, a fascinatingly creative band. Well, the reason I mention them is, you know, obviously you guys have very different kind of musical landscapes to what you do, but... Both of you are bands that continue not only to put out music prolifically, but to almost get better with age. And I'm not just saying that to blow smoke up your ass. Like, you're two bands that with every release, especially of the last 10 years, just kind of almost get more vital and more creative and more interesting as time goes on. Um, what is that for you? Where does that come from? Is it a response to the world? I think that everybody that grew up at that time, there was this kind of attitude which was like you know fuck them fuck the world um i'm doing this and it was a kind of anti-careerist thing about it so none of us thought we were embarking upon a career in the music business we were just making stuff which is entirely a different attitude and okay some people lost that along the way and got sucked into the business but a lot of us didn't and we still basically think that, that it's not a career. It's not a, you know, we're not in the music business. We're just people making stuff. Um, and, and that, you know, if that's your basic sort of principle, mm -hmm. you're not worried about what people think of you or, you know, how many records you sell or don't sell or, or current or, trends or, or current yeah, trends yeah. or anything. You're just trying to make something you think is good. And stand the test of time, and that you know you can look back on and be proud of. <laughs> or not always. Are there records in your canon that you look back on and go, "We could have done differently or Most better"? Of it. There? Really? Most of it. Yeah, eighty percent of it. So that's what keeps better. the fire alive, right? Yeah, I guess. You're never resting you know, on and, your laurels. And, and, and the re you know from here album, uh, by the time we finished it, of course, you know you don't want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because there's, it's all creative, but then it gets to the end process of you know mixing, mastering, putting it in order, and, and by the time you finished all that, it's kind of oh, enough. Um, and then I, it's been a couple of months, and I, I thought yesterday I'll listen to it again, but I can still hear the bits where you go, eh, I could have done that better. But mostly, I think it's really good. Actually, I was quite uh, quite pleased with it. Um, but yeah. How do you find the live side of, of the band now in the... This is my favourite version of New Malami to work in. The year that you're um, in. Because as a f the five of us, we kind of sit together well. We're kind of easy with each other. We're all... Uh, yeah, we all trust each other, I suppose. Because um, it's very it, much a band, isn't it? It's, it's very never much been a band. Like Absolutely, it's your about, thing that's backed up. No, 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 no. People, will, people, because I'm the original member, people must think you know it's it's me and some other guys. No, no, no. The, the thing about New Model Army, and I think one of the reasons that's helped us stay creative and and, and interesting is that every that we've had this slow organic turnover of members, which is that every five or ten years someone new arrives. And one, even if it's a five-piece band, one new person all it changes, takes is one, right? changes all the dynamics of the, of the band. It's like being in a new band, even though the rest of us might not, you know, been together for years and years and years. One new person does change everything. And that's been really, really, really good for us. 
um, definitely sort of helps, I think. Well, it keeps things fresh, doesn't it? And constantly challenging and exciting. I think what happens if you're with the same people for years and years and years is that you learn the areas of conflict and you, you avoid them, which means you start to turn in smaller and smaller circles. And that hasn't happened with us, really. Um, do you like conflict within the camp or do you like an easier, <laughs> more peaceful no, I like, I don't, dynamic? I don't particularly like conflict in the camp. I, and, and none of us do. We're all quite English in that way. We don't particularly... You don't confrontation. Uh, we don't, yeah. but we're not particularly confrontational. We have our moments, of course, of, of being unhappy with each other or arguing. But mostly we argue about the music. Well, that's fine. But for the greater good. To yeah, get the for the greater good. The end, again, yeah. again, yeah, for the greater good. Um, I think that all of us have got enough... Com- you know, there's fucking hell, there's enough conflict around all of us these days, and not to mention our own personal lives, um, to not need it in the band, to fuel it. Do you know what I mean? There's plenty out there. If you need conflict to fuel you, it's easy to find. So, no, I don't particularly want it in the band. I find it, it's a bit of a waste of time. I find that that we're good together and we we because we don't tend to have too much of that um, and we work fast because we don't have too much of that. And that that's, tends to be good for a band as well, to work fast. I mean... We were kind of conscious this year that we needed to do. We wanted to make an album. We knew we knew it had to be this year because next year's our fortieth, and everybody wants to talk about the fucking past. <laughs> and um, so it had to be this year. And it came to Christmas, and it was like we didn't have very much in the can. Um, so January, February, just worked like you know really, really hard on it, and then recorded it in nine days in in March. Um, bang, 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 bang. Wow. Um, and it was a really, you know, just rolling, 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 working, working. I, I like working. And I like working with everybody else that's in, currently in the band. I remember when we were driving up uh, to, to, the, to, to Norway to make the record. Um, most, people, most, of, most of the band flew, actually. Um, but somebody had to drive. And it's a three-day drive. Uh, and me and Lee who's one of the producers, um, very, very talented guy. Uh, we, we, we drove up and, um, and we made the, we, we talked a lot on the way up about what we were going to do. Um, and it was interesting that when they came round to do the pre-production round, round to our place in Bradford, they didn't want us to kind of finish, finish, finish and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse songs. They wanted the songs to, to have a lot of unfinished and undecided bits so there's a looseness so, there the, to play so with. the place would have an effect on us nice. in that way um, but when we were driving up we made this rule that nobody was allowed to say no which was a really really good rule so you, so if anybody had an idea anybody in the band or, or Lee and Jamie you know, the two producer engineers uh, had an idea it had to be tried before anyone was allowed to say no and that was a really good recipe for making the record because there were quite a few things when somebody suggests something, like my instinct was go, oh no. And then we tried it and I went, oh yeah. So how many times did you then say no after you put in that rule? Sometimes. But, Sometimes but, but, but we tried less... something and it, and it didn't work and we all kind of agreed, no, that doesn't work. But did many of the things that you did try end up staying and yes. being explored? Yes, and... there were things that, wow. you know, the, the, uh, from my own point of view, I was going, oh no, I'm not sure. Uh, but we try it and, I, and then I'd go, Oh yeah, you know, and I think that's really important. And again, sort of, kind of trusting each other, and that we're all. And I found that with 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 us that we that we found it easy to agree. Although we all like really different kinds of music, and we all have very different lives, and we have different kind of attitudes to life outside the band. Really, um, when it comes to music, we tend to agree most of the time, um, which I think. Uh, easier than the most versions of New Model Army. We tend to agree on what kind of works and what doesn't. Uh, and we've agreed on, you know, when, when, when Marshall joined the band, uh, we auditioned a number of guitar players. I remember it was an easy choice. We all agreed it was easy, straightforward. And when Kerry joined the band, you know, in 2012, the other four of us, yeah, it's him. There was no kind of disagreement. Um, kind of feel, it was all feel and 
sort of we feel the same about it all, I think. Do you, in your personal life, surround yourself with many people who have opposing and different views to you politically? And do you think that's important to surround yourself with people who do come from different schools of thought? Because obviously, you know, right now the country is very divided. And Do I know any Brexiteers? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. do I just Does that go- affect your friendship with them? Do you allow it to not get in the way? It depends. It depends. I, I find it difficult to be friends with an out and out racist. Um, but if, the, but I can, I tolerate political disagreements. You know, uh, and even in with my within my own blood family, I'm sure this is true right across the country. Within my own blood family, um, you know, disagree about you know, Brexit or, or the direction of the country. Um, but they're still my brothers and sisters. Uh, that that's ab- above. It's interesting about uh, Brexit because uh, we all have different loyalties. We have kind of outgoing loyalty. So the the people you're most loyal to, the people closest to you, the blood family or, or people that are really close, um, and then and then you have a kind of loyalty to your to your area you live in, and you have a loyalty to your city or. You're part of the country. Have a vague loyalty to the country. You have a loyalty to, you know, Europe, which is a kind of area with this big common history. You have a loyalty to the planet. You have loyalty to people that you feel akin with in terms of uh, the music that you love or the the art that you love. You have a loyalty to people who love the same football team that you love. You have all these different, and sometimes they're colliding loyalties. The one about the country being important, this is what I can't get, is that I don't get that. Yes, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm English or British or, uh, yeah, it's a, the, it's, a, it's a loyalty. It's a, you know, I'm from England. I grew up in England with the English it's culture. It's part of your identity. It's part of your identity. But uh, is this more important than my loyalty to Europe or... Uh, to my city no not at all is it uh, more important than my loyalty to the planet absolutely not um, that, that's what I don't get and I would have thought that the nation state is this kind of artificial construct you know some nation states Germany have only been around 150 years uh, this nation state's only been around for you know a few hundred years um, is it, it, what's so sacrosanct about a nation state haven't we got past that Especially at a time like now when we are very aware that we're all stuck on the same planet and we're deeply fucking it up. The, you know, the most frightening thing I've read in recent years is that in my lifetime, 40% of everything else on the planet has disappeared. That's fucking terrifying. Um, terrifying legacy. And, and how is, um, you know, and people think that Brexit is an important issue. It's like, I fucking grow up. And left and right, and those kind of what now I think are almost well in silly theory, distractions. In theory, not. No? Um, in theory, there is still a division between left and right. Um, uh, at a basic level, you could say the right believe in a highly hierarchical society where... Um, where, which is ordered in terms of wealth and power. Um, so the people um, with wealth and power are, are allowed to, uh, you know, exploit their wealth and power and, and down remain as, there. And, and going down the scale, uh, people have their position. And then the left wing principle is that um, we should basically be looking at all of us in this together. Uh, but you know the left, the left liberal um, side of politics has got a lot to answer for. Um, partly because you know that it's been uh, you know this the division of between rich and poor, which has been allowed over the last forty years. Okay, it's years of Tory rule, but. You know, there was a new Labour government in between. There's been all sorts of opportunities to try to hold this back. 
And then the left have done the unpardonable thing is allow themselves to be divided into identity politics. Yeah. Which is which is the territory identity politics is the territory of the right. Of course. It's not the territory of the left and and the, you know the left have allowed this to happen. Um playing into the hands of these fucking idiots. It's disheartening, isn't it? And worrying. Uh, uh, yes. To witness. It is scary, disheartening, and uh, very frightening, uh, and the future that we face. But it's not all over. Um, Do you remain optimistic? Uh, it depends on what you mean by the word optimistic. I still think, I still love life. I still believe in soul. I certainly believe in music. I believe in uh, beauty. I believe in, uh, you know, that I'm a, I'm a little piece of the whole. I think if anything is true of the From Here album, it was a desire to step, take a step back out of all this, everybody screaming at everybody. Um, and and the landscape that we went, I mean, Nimble Army is always famous for bleak, you know, big, bleak, wide open. And, and obviously this album is very much that. Uh, but to take a step back and actually have a sense of scale about everything. So the first song, you know, Passing Through, well, we are. You know, the life is short and, and, and it's not very important. As individually, we're not very important. I was saying this with and a then, friend the other day. Uh, and, it's so true. Like, and and the, the last track is a plea for a sense of scale. And I remember when when, when we were writing the, the last track and, and the the last words, you know, let's go home and look in the mirror and, and look at throw our heads back and laugh. I thought, I really want those to be the last words on the record. And should I have a sense of... of of the ephem ephemeral nature of us. You know, nature will go on. Mm -hmm. The ridiculousness of The ridiculousness humanity. of us. We're all ridiculous. <laughs> we are, aren't we? You know, I'm ridiculous. <laughs> uh, what's your thoughts? We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. What's your thoughts on Morrissey? Because the Smiths were a band like you guys that were so important to independent music and culture and you know, a sense of liberal art in the 80s. Like, you know, you were the two leading bands, really, with people like Billy Bragg. I mean, there was a lot, but, you know, the Smiths were a band that really changed this country at that time, I think, for, for the better. Um, and in recent times, Morrissey's kind of just <laughs> removed himself further and further away from reality, it seems, and a lot of people now who would have once held that guy in very high regard now seem to go, he's lost me. Um... It's not a big problem for me because I was never a fan. Right. So that makes it easier. Yeah. Do you keep up to date with anything he says? Are you interested in any of it? Do you have any thoughts on it? Or no, do you just kind of go, let him get on with it? You know, uh, uh, no. Is Penny, no. Ra is Penny Rambo someone that you know? No. I think you two would get on so, so well. I, like I so was, much about both of your careers and philosophies and personalities remind me of the other one. All right, that, We've got to get you two together I, to do a podcast. Uh, I think. Uh, okay, uh, interesting. I was never a big, uh, never a big sort of crass fan because no. I, I felt that the, the, that it was all about, um, getting the message across. New Model Army was never about getting the message across. New Model Army was about making music. Yep. Um, but then the just, way his career just, evolved uh, was a lot more in yeah, line okay. with that, I think. And maybe and poetry uh, I, and I haven't, I haven't, I don't know enough. He's done a lot probably. of similar stuff to you in terms of like live readings of poetry to, you know, kind of scored musical backgrounds. Okay. I've got to get you two together. Okay. I think you'd have a lot to talk about. I'm happy to meet anyone. <laughs> um, let's talk about, if we can, spirituality. Where do you stand in the, the world? Of... <laughs> I'm going deep on you, Justin. I'm sorry. It's the end of a long day. I was in, we were in Brazil last year, and I was talking to somebody after one of the shows, and, and she said, and we were talking about, you know, I was saying, I love this place. Um, even Sao Paulo, which, you know, should be in some ways it's hell on earth you know a city of 21 million people industrial powerhouse mm -hmm. um it isn't even you know it is not a beautiful city in any shape or form uh and yet something about it 
And she said, what you have to understand about South America is that, that, that in, in, in your part of the world, you know, there is this thing about spirituality or, or the material world or, you know, what is a dream and what is real. And she said, the boundaries between these things here are very thin. And I went, ah, that makes sense to me. Now I understand why I like it here. Um, so I don't... I, I grew up in a religious family. Well, no, I, I grew up... Yeah, I did grow up in a religious family. My father was um, uh, born in Canada, Irish-Canadian, but came to England when he was about 12. Um, he was interested all his life in religion and God. He went to church and he went to Quaker meeting and he went to mosque and he went to all of them because he thought they were all basically the same, which in a certain way they are. And he was really interested in, in uh, God. My mother was deep, by her nature, although she was also came from a sort of traditional English religious uh, Methodist, I think, family, um, uh, was, but her nature was quite sceptical. They kind of they were good for each other in that sense. Balanced she, each other out. Yeah, yeah. She kept his feet on the ground or tried to. Um, but I grew up with these sort of ideas around me. There's a story about my father which I always loved, which is um, in 1940 he joined the RAF to become a pilot at the beginning of the war, and he failed his flying test, and uh, and strangely he kept the piece of paper of his failure notice, and it said. Um, uh, Barry Sullivan, this officer does not appear to know where the ground is. That's so multi-layered, that is. I say anything about my dear dad. Said, oh, dad, that was true. Um, <laughs> uh, but I grew up with this this idea of, uh, you know, religion or... or uh, but it seems to me so obvious, you don't need to do or do anything about it. I sometimes think that I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sort of enrage some listeners. I don't particularly want to enrage anyone, but it seems to me that every now and again you have that split second. You might be on the top of a mountain, or you might be by the sea, or you might be in a desert, or you might be at a gig, or you might be in church, or you might be on the bus, and you suddenly have this split second when you cease to have an awareness of yourself and you have an awareness of the whole thing like that you suddenly sense that you are a tiny part of a whole amazing thing and then it goes away again and you go back to being you and that's basically the truth is that that is you know that is it and I think that if you if you you exercise your spiritual awareness and and spend years studying and and meditating and stuff maybe you can hold on to that feeling for a few seconds more but i'm too lazy because i just let it go because i know it's going to come again because i know that's the truth so that'll do i wholeheartedly not only agree with that but i had something in that exact kind of exact scenario you're talking about happened to me in february i was on tour with a band uh and i had this amazing two weeks where i was djing open up for this group and playing to like five thousand people a night and you know it was just a very elating and rewarding and exciting experience and then i had a day off in bruges and i was just walking through you know old bruges and never been there before and it was a break from the not only monotony but the chaos and the fun of tour and then you're all of a sudden in this historical town on your own and that exact kind of thing happened where i was like whoop out of myself for a few moments where i took it all in and was like ah, wow ain't life sweet and then you're back again so that's it for you right because you can i, mean, I was can... lucky enough to have the near death once you know which is i've which had that a, too which yeah. is a classical you know and, and it's incre in, like they do say the close is you are to death is the more you feel alive obviously you don't want to live in that state but when you have something like that happen it does hit home how transient and fragile and special and wonderful life is doesn't it yeah what happened to you uh i was electrocuted on stage in um, i wasn't expecting that <laughs> uh, i've had a few shocks 
on stage and off where, where you touch some electricity and it throws you. Um, but this one, I, I picked up a stage light, I was going to shine it in the audience, and, um, but it wasn't on. And my hand was all sweaty, so like an idiot, I put my hand in the back. And then the engineer saw that when it was turning on. And I don't understand electricity, but basically my hand clamped on it and I couldn't let go. And I had this split second of feeling the current coming up my left arm and going, don't, in a slightly Homer Simpson sort of way. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I'm on my back and I'm going shaking with this light. And everyone, it's the last song of the encore, so everyone thinks it's part of the show. And I'm on this for about 12 seconds, which is quite a long time. And, uh, and then apparently one of the techs worked out what was happening and kicked it out of my hand. Um, and then they carried me downstairs, down to the dressing room, and there was this Swiss doctor who happened to be in the audience, fortunately, and he was trying to restart my heart. So this is about three minutes, which is quite a long time. Um, and it was all the, the thing they say all the time about, uh, you know, the, the, the white light. Leaving and your body, the, the, and, yeah. the, the floating feeling, and being warm, and it's like the best drug experience you've ever had, only a million million times better. It's like it's basically that, and I think the medical profession believe that it's some kind of super endorphin that when your heart stops, it floods your body. Yeah, it takes away all pain. It it puts you in this wonderful place. What happens after that? Who knows? But this is the process of dying is wonderful, and then. It was like one of those records that starts with a distant sound with lots of reverb and gets louder and louder and louder and closer and closer and closer. And it was basically all the people in the room shouting. You're back in the room. And, and, I, and yeah. I was coming back, and I remember just as I came back, coming back, and I remember thinking, why doesn't anyone ever leave me alone? <laughs> and I didn't want to come back at all. And I came back, and there was it was Swiss, nice out there. Uh, there was yeah. a Swiss guy sort of on top of me, trying to get massage, banging up my heart, trying to massage my heart back, and lo- and the room full of people sort of shouting, and 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 uh, and quite quickly, I was sort of vaguely aware of what happened. Um, uh, and then in but, the moments that follow that and the days and often yeah, nights, then you go, you then know, you go. Then you, I came back. I, I was in hospital for a couple of days just because of the burns, and apparently electrocution takes all the salt out of your blood, so put it on a drip for a couple of days. But I was all right. I came back to England and sat in the garden, and went, "Wow, sky, yeah, wow, flowers, I can breathe air." <laughs> <laughs> Except that the, the nearest thing I, I kept trying to sort of vaguely recreate it. Um, and the nearest thing I could get was to, to get, because I wasn't by the sea or anything, but it was to get a heavy weight and, and float down to the bottom of a swimming pool and sit there <laughs> underwater with it. <laughs> holding my breath as long as I could. But it wasn't really the same. I, after that, I was doing this interview in Canada with this woman, and she started talking about this, and I thought, at any minute she, now, she's going to start talking about the new album, whatever it was, I can't remember. And, and she didn't. She just went on and on and on and on about this, asking me questions. And then that was the end of the interview. And, and she said, I really wanted to know because I'm addicted to electricity. I said, what? Wow. She said, she said um, I grew up on a, on a farm in the prairies and, and I used to go out to the electric fence and put my finger on it and get the kick. And that kind of little buzz that you get. That's where it started. That's it? Exactly. That's where it, it started. And she said this, and these days, these days I plug myself into the main. It's got a main line. Once it. a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once a week. She said, okay, okay. Where was that? Somewhere in Canada. I don't Incredible. Know what happened to her. There's some weird and wonderful people out there, isn't yeah. there? Let's talk about, not that they're weird and wonderful. Perhaps they are. Um, you know, the, the fan base and the the followers that you've amassed over the years, because it's a unique group of people, isn't it? And it's a unique type of a person, I think, that is invested well, heavily I, in New Model Army. I and don't I think, know them all personally. Of course. And of course but you must they, notice certain and, and of course they, And of course the idea and, is that, you know, people say, oh, you've got this travelling following that travel around with you. And we have, but it's not the same people from tour to tour. It changes. Yes. Um, but I think every group or act or artist, you know, they have followers and there's commonalities in those people, right? Yeah, but if you want to know what the commonality is, you need to talk to them, not me. True. But have you made observations over the years that I've, you've I've once was processed? Talking, and I've, to, I've told other people this, actually, but somebody, 
came up to me once and said, I've worked out who likes New Model Army. Right. And I went, really? And they went, yeah. And I said, please enlighten me. And they said, basically intelligent people trying to work through a large amount of personal darkness. <laughs> okay. It's quite, a, quite an astute observation. <laughs> Yeah. Is there truth in that for you? Uh, would you fall well, into like said, would you I, fall into that category? Are you an intelligent person that's trying to work through some personal, personal darkness? darkness? Actually, I expect that probably applies to most of the population. Right. Well, you'd hope that more of them were a bit more intelligent, but <laughs> the personal darkness thing is certainly I, prevalent. I think that I think that, that because the band is about stuff, but what it's about is a bit nebulous so there isn't a political orthodoxy within the within the stuff we write that would you know contrast with say you know, the crass stuff yes or, or billy bragg or, or anything that there isn't a political th- orthodoxy you know i remember writing something like my people right or wrong which was trying to get in the head of a nationalist you know let's understand it well that uh, that song understands it pretty well or one of the chosen um where I'm getting inside the head of a religious maniac. Um, that was pretty easy for me because I, I remember being, uh, when I was 16, 15, 16, I was always cult hopping. You know, I, I, I know what it's like to be in a cult where you think, well, it's glorious. You, you're right and everybody else is wrong and you've got this special knowledge which no one else has got and you're special and you're right. And, every, you know, what a wonderful feeling. Um, to so belong. I understand that. Yeah. And... It wasn't particularly a critique of it. It was just a song about the the, the experience. Um, so there isn't a there isn't a sort of central orthodoxy or a, a you know one political idea that we're trying to push. Likewise, when it comes to ideas about nature, God, you know these things, the, 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 it's just ideas. Freedom of expression. Freedom, of, yeah, I guess. So it tends to attract people that are interested in ideas, but different kinds of people with different ideas and different kinds of people I once we were once on a, another story I've told quite often actually we were once playing in Istanbul and we were on the plane going over and there was this woman that, that's been to see us a lot and I, I know her a bit and um, I said are you coming to see us again <laughs> you've seen us hundreds of times and she said well I'm only half coming to see you but I can go to Istanbul and, as a tourist and look at the Blue Mosque. But if I go to Istanbul to see my favourite band, I'm going to meet someone Turkish and it's going to be their favourite band. And straight away, I've got this kind of social network of people where immediately you've got something quite major in common. Um, so it does kind of work like that. I can, I can see that. You know that you're going to get on with this person. You're, you might not agree with them on everything, exactly. but you're going to get on. a starting point, yeah. That's the best thing about traveling. And when you get to travel as part of a, a touring band, you know, you kind of get to get plugged into local cultures and communities, don't you? Whether it's via a promoter or the fans. Yeah. It's a very blessed existence yeah. in the little experience that I've had with it. Yeah. Do you love the experiences that being in a band and traveling around the world and touring has afforded you? Yeah. You're aware of how yeah. uh, important uh, uh, and how wonderful How privileged it is. I am. Yeah. I love every second of it, really. I don't mind... I'd, you know, I don't mind airports. I don't mind the hours of doing nothing. I don't mind the... the it's all the, part of the... It's kind of... You know, the overall journey, right? Can't yeah. all be sweet. And that's yeah, a means I, to I an think end. That, I think that that runs through everything we've done. I mean, there's a song on the on the album called Never Arriving, which I I really like, but it's quite a personal song. But, you know, the safest place I know is here between departing and arriving. I, I've never particularly wanted to arrive anywhere. I love setting off. I don't, Setting I'm off is the best. Slightly disappointed isn't it? when you arrive. <laughs> you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the it's journey. the journey. Yeah, yeah. That's the best bit. And that is true of life as well, isn't it? Uh, yeah, right. I mean, it's true of a Every lot day of things. It's true of. It's true of, it's true of. It's true of. It's, yeah, it's true of a lot of things. It's true, true of making love. You know, it's not the arriving at the end that's the the best bit. It's the. It's getting there. The twists and the turns. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I. I I, one of my favourite ever lyrics, of course, Born Under a Wandering Star. You know, uh, So I guess my mum said that when I was a kid, if she was going anywhere in a car, I would just jump in the car to go. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we, exactly yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And even if she was just going to the shops, you know, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to go. 
Um, that runs through every, you know, the, the, the lyrics. I'm sure, you know, I've written about this quite a lot because that's very me. I, it's slightly weird with, with lyrics because musically, New Model Army is very much uh, a cooperative. You know, we work around each other, we work with each other. I'm rubbish at working alone musically. I need partners. I, I can't create anything decent alone. Um, and I've always had a kind of key person. Um, for years it was Robert and then Michael uh, is the person I bounce off the most but actually Kerry and Marshall and Dean all of them I, I find useful to bounce off um, but when it comes to lyrics I'm basically on my own writing now I bounce those off people um, obviously for years I bounced things off Jules you know as a great writer um, a great poet um, and other people. Um, Lee was one of the first, and Lee and Jamie were one of the first producers that actually wanted to talk to me about the lyrics. But a lot of it can be quite personal. It's a personal, you know, a lot of it quite, can be quite a personal vision, even if I'm not writing about myself. Much more so than the music, which is a kind of cooperative. Uh, how is Jules? She's good, she's busy. She's busy, she's writing a novel again. Um, for the first time in quite a long time, really good, really, really good novel. And she's always creating art and, and, and ideas and poetry. And, yeah, and still running the studio? She's still doing that? Still doing her, her tattoo studio, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's an all round um, Renaissance yeah. woman that, that she sort of creates like she breathes, you know, she can't not create. Is that how you see yourself as well? I mean, would you be like no. out, out of your mind bored no, if you I'm weren't? No, I'm not quite like that. Robert what do you get up to outside Robert of music? Like that. Um, I tend to sort of sit around playing guitar a lot of the time, but I'm not really doing anything other than just doodling. I don't know what I could would do if I didn't. You know, I have a, I have a guitar that lives with me in the car. Another one next to the, you know, there's one. The car guitar is very is good for for traffic jams and and you know when you're stuck somewhere and you sit and play guitar. And actually, even if you've got a really, really, really good idea, you can always, uh, you know, play a little bit and steer with your knee if the road's reasonably open. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the listeners will be pleased to know that I'm actually going to be banned next month. <laughs> Not for that, but right, uh, right. for a compilation of points. So the roads will be safer for the next six months or so. And that's it. Will that affect your life or are you all right? Yeah, it probably will massively. Yeah. But uh, I'll take it. I've richly deserved the ban, I'll be honest. Just better and, fill uh, that time up with plenty of shows and, uh, and get yourself on tour. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to walk and get public transport. Probably good for me, I don't know. Do you still think about Robert? I do think about Robert every now and again. Actually, I was talking about somebody else about this the other day. Um, Robert, Robert, Robert. Some people's lives go through a kind of journey and they kind of arrive at a place. Tommy, our longtime manager, died very young and very sadly for his children, especially, and his wife, um, and sadly for the band, actually. Um, his life was cut short, but he did make a journey in his life from crazy young person to wise dad. And he was a kind of, there was something in Tommy that was kind of fulfilled in somewhere, in some way. Robert was not that. Robert was not fulfilled. Robert was a, a restless soul. Like most of the best creative artists, he didn't, uh, he didn't, did he find peace? Uh, no. Was he still creating? Yes. Um, he would have gone on creating forever. Would he have ever found home? Uh, I don't know. And maybe because of the, his restless nature, his ghost seems to me still around. Maybe that's me just reading stuff into it. Uh, obviously, we had this very strange relationship. We were very, very different. 
and we disagreed about almost everything except music. Um, and we disagreed about music sometimes, but we were very good together. We were perfect foil for each other. Um, yeah, I still feel him around sometimes. Michael is a different kind of personality a little bit, but there, there are similarities. Um, I think it's a drummer thing. Drummers make good producers, and I, I think that's partly because they're balancing a lot of different sounds. They get, they've got a full spectrum or a sound within a drum kit, you know, from the kick up to the cymbals and all the sounds in between. And they most most drummers, as far as I understand, certainly Robert and, and uh, Michael, were sort of perfectionists. Everything had to be in the right place and everything had to be just right. And they, they, they listen. They really listen. They're both very sensitive to, to music um, in a way that I'm not. Uh, I imagine stuff. I don't really listen. I imagine. So I'm quite good at coming up with great ideas. Sometimes I find only weeks later that actually what I imagined is not on tape at all. I was just imagining it. What's on tape is rubbish. You know, it was just it sounded good in my head. So I need That's people, the struggle there, right? If it was I need easy, it would just be a constant. people actually listen. Um, but, but Robert, unlike Michael, um, Robert was also a great guitar player and bass player, so he wrote whole pieces of music. Michael tends to come up with really great rhythmical ideas, and he can talk about music because he doesn't play other instruments. He doesn't create the other sounds. He... he he imagines them actually, you know, never arriving. He, he said to me, we had this kind of basic drum bass rhythm guitar groove and I wrote four songs with it and they were all rubbish. Um, and I was really struggling. He said, put an acoustic guitar on it. And I went, huh? So I went, okay. And I did. And I went, ah, you know, it was like a little moment opening. Um, as I said, I need other people. Robert was Robert was a Robert was a, a unique talent, both as a musician and a kind of just an all-round sort of creator. And but uh, sort of a tragic figure in a different in a number of different ways. I don't really want to talk about his personal life, but you know. And your personal life, you're in a good spot. You're happy. You My seem, personal life, I'm certainly not going to talk about. No, but you're good. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, you seem good, man. You seem very uh, spirited. And the record's brilliant. And uh, I'm sure there'll be many more brilliant ones still to come. What's on the cards for the immediate future? On the immediate future, uh, we've got a few bits and pieces to, to still doing over the summer, a couple of festivals and stuff. Um, sometime at the end, towards the end of this month, we're actually going to get in the studio and start thinking about what we're going to play. In, in the, when we Always a struggle, touring. I imagine, right? Sorry? Always a struggle because well, there's so much to choose from. Well, let's forget about what we're going to play that's old. Let's, first of all, work, work the new stuff. Because although we played most of it live in the studio, sometimes there were more parts um, than, than were there or there were more backing vocals than, than we can actually do. So you have to kind of rethink it a little bit. And I quite like that. And there are some bits on the album we go, oh, we could have done that better. Let's do it better live. Um, and, and as soon as a, a song gets on stage it's a whole new form of life it's a whole isn't it? new yeah. form yeah and, and I know that the songs will sound completely different by Christmas yeah yeah and yeah I'm quite excited about that um, we don't plan to just you know regurgitate what we did in the studio exactly let's free them on stage I mean one of the sad things about these days is that I remember when we did the Ghost of Cain say or, or Thun of Consolation I think most of those songs we played quite a lot before we recorded them so we'd taken them out on the road and they and when you take a song on the road... They evolve, right? They evolve, and they... By the time you get to record them, they've already revolved, uh, evolved. And I, I think that's a really good thing. Unfortunately, you can't do that anymore, because the moment you play a new song live, they're, they're discussing whether they like it in California the next day. You yeah. know, it's, it's... Smartphones, man. Uh, yeah, I know, and it's a, it's a real sad thing. 
So you can't do that. And, and, and that's like a year before the record comes out. So everybody's going to be tired of that song by the time the record comes out. Or they're going to go, oh, I like the live version. I'd be listening to for six months better than I like the... So you can't really do it anymore in that way. I think comedians struggle with that so much as well. Like they can't workshop material in that same way because there's always someone there going, that's right. filming and putting it on YouTube. Would you, ever, would you ever ban phones from your gig? Pretty difficult to do. I, I sort of... Would you be into I, the idea or against I, it? Though? I've been thinking about it. I know that some people do it. You know, your phones are banned. Um, part of me thinks yes, but we've also always had a kind of rule of not telling people what to do. Yeah. And so then by doing that, you'd be going against that. And kind of, yeah. It's back like, on yourselves. It's and... like the, the thing of everybody say yeah. You know, that is yeah, to me yeah, an yeah. absolute no-no. Yeah. Everybody clap. No, definitely not. Do what the hell you want. And even when we did the Thousand Voices project, you know, where everybody was invited to come and sing, people said, are you going to tell people which parts to sing? I'm going, no, no, no. You know, let people respond in the way they respond. It was interesting, we were talking about the audience earlier, and you was, I talk other sometimes to other singers, and they, they talk about the audience as if it's a sort of single beast. But I tend not to think of them as single beasts. I think they're all sort of different individuals with different backstories and different favourite songs and different ways of responding to the music. Some people want to make a gang. They want to be in the middle of the dance floor. They want to dance with each other. They want to make pyramids. They want to do whatever they want to do. Other people want to, you know, dance quietly in a space at the back of the room other people just want to stand against a pillar somewhere and listen and absorb and, and yeah. absorb and some people want to shout out and and they want to clap loudly and some people don't really want to respond in an obvious way at all they just want to listen and watch and we're not in the business of telling people how to respond or what to do just we'll do what we're doing take it in your own personal way ideally with your phones in your pocket <laughs> I do with your phones in your pocket. Now there is a, you know, I remember when, I remember when uh, this uh, first sort of mini camcorders came out, and there was a picture of, I think it was taken at Alton Towers. Do you remember that yeah, advert? Yeah, of course. As somebody on the front of a roller coaster who was filming themselves on a roller coaster, I remember thinking, this is dumb. This is really stupid. You're you're not experiencing what you're experiencing. You're going to experience a, a, a poor semblance of it later. That'll never take off. Yeah, 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 and yet here we are. Here we are. <laughs> People are desperate to sort of. Uh, again, I suppose it's trying to to hold on to a moment. Yeah, is that desire of people to hold on to things? Or well, maybe what we were talking about earlier as well, yeah, exactly, we're trying to exactly. distill this e moment of exactly perfection. That. Distill this moment. You Whereas can't actually, distill the moment. just enjoy it, let it wash over you, and then there'll be another one. You know, there's a song in the middle of the album, the, line. The, the one happy song on the album, I Am Where I Am, which is absolutely a sort of put your fucking phone away song. <laughs> uh, Justin, an absolute pleasure to see you again, my friend. Cheers. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's always a delight talking to you, and I'm going to look into making this double header with you and Penny happen because I would, I would love to, to make that an event. Are you interested? Are you keen? Uh, I'll, I'll do anything. It's on then. It's happening. Okay. Thank you, mate. All the best. And now I've seen the very worst that you could be. And you've had to...